And I want folks to take a couple of minutes, um, just sort of silently think or jot down these ideas. Um, just think in your mind, three skills that you want your children to be proficient in by the end of the school year. Um, in Boston, our school year is 180 days. So 180, in 180 days, what three academic skills and what three social emotional skills do you want your children to be um, proficient, if not masterful in? If we were all in a room together, I'm sure some of these would probably come up in terms of academic skills, writing their names, letters, reading simple words. Um, for social emotional, kindness, empathy, appreciating different perspectives, counting to 10 for academic. If we had to do all of these individually over 180 days, we wouldn't be able to do it all in 380 days. So the other sort of perspective we want folks to sort of ground themselves in is that the, the relationship between educating the head and educating your heart as well. And in the center of both of those it are children and families. So let's actually get into setting up our classrooms. Yeah, so, so when we think about setting up our, our classroom environments, right, it's more than just uh, tables and chairs, right? We're thinking about, you know, experiences. We're thinking about emotion. We're thinking about, you know, again, relationships. Everyone's highlighting the importance of relationships. So I want you to think, you know, for, you know, to ourselves, you know, where we feel more comfortable or not, not necessarily, or where we feel, you know, most at home and not necessarily your house, right? But, but what about the space makes you feel at home? So it sounds like when we're talking about an environment that feels at home, makes you feel like you're in a home and a welcoming place, that you're not talking about tables and chairs and cubbies and bins and things like that. But again, you're talking about what makes you feel that way, how people are talking to you, softness, um, images of your families, mm -hmm. of things that are familiar, maybe things that are interesting that you don't know about. Um, so that's important for us to, again, think about. Be thinking about what do we need to have in this space that lets our little friends feel like they are coming from home. As we look at the next images um, from classrooms, what we really want folks to think about are what are the implicit messages of this environment? So what is it, when you look at this image of a classroom or a routine or a structure that we're gonna share with you, what does it tell you? If you were like a little three and four year old coming into this space, what does it tell you about your role here? What you're supposed to be doing here? Mm -hmm. What's gonna be happening here? Because again, this is what's going on in our little friends' minds when they first come to school. Many of them have been in some kind of group setting before, but many of them haven't. This is gonna be their first time being in your classroom, however. So as you look at these images, one, think about what are you gonna do in your environment to welcome your little friends? But two, think about the messages that you're getting from some of these images, if that makes sense. Here's our door. Before the door opens, this is what they're looking at. Here's the first sign that they see when they come in a classroom. Simple like that. So what do people think just these first two images before they've even stepped foot or their first steps into the classroom um, say about them? So it sounds like an implicit message, some implicit messages just from those first two images is that I can be many things. Um, if you notice from the door, I belong here, absolutely. It doesn't just say welcome tigers or welcome new butterflies, but welcome scientists, mathematicians, artists, athletes, welcome creators. Um, these, because again, children are many different things. We're, we're all a multiple multitude of different things. Um, and that I'm welcome here and people here like me. I love that. And I'm liked for who I am. So again, the idea that you're many different things um, and that you come perfectly packaged and perfectly formed um, on, in your first steps coming into the classroom. That's a really important and impactful image and idea for children to get right off the bat. Let's take a look at some other images. Here's one of our classrooms. What does it say in this space? Oh, cozy. cozy, I love it. Yeah. yeah. 
One of my favorite words, like right? Mm -hmm. Inviting. Don't you want to come in here? Everyone has a space, comfortable. Yes. It actually seems like it invites safe um, a lot of exploration and tactile um, uh, engagement. So um, everything on the level so that they can feel welcome and everything has its place. Absolutely. There is some recent research that shows that overly decorated classrooms actually impedes learning. So the way this classroom is organized is every child has a pattern that belongs to them. And you can see from the classroom that every, the, it pretty much is the organizing feature of the classroom. I would send a letter to my kids before they came to school and I'd sort of introduce myself. Hi friends, uh, I'm gonna be your teacher and I can't wait, can't wait to meet you. Here's a, little piece of, here's a little piece of a pattern. When you come to school on Monday, I want you to look all around the classroom and see if you can find your pattern. Everyone has um, the, the same thing, but something that's uniquely theirs. So this really, again, becomes the way the whole classroom is organized. Um, so when they come in, again, very sp uh, sparely uh, uh, decorated or kind of set up. But again, the thing that is most clear that we have here, oh, everyone's pattern is someplace in the classroom. This, this teacher used um, a little like, made like a little flag up there. I've known teachers who put them on to like a welcome wreath, but over there on the right, they'll find a cubby with their, with their name and their pattern on it. Um, and I mean, you know, you can use their picture with the pattern to kind of reinforce that as well, or to remind them. I could cover uh, little pillows. Um, and again, this was again, a way for them to know where to sit um, in meeting. Um, this also helped them. This was also their nap pillow. So when it was time for them to go take a nap, um, and this really helped again, this idea of organization and knowing like what you're doing and where you're going really helped. And it also helped, um, sort of minimize the whole, I don't want to sit next to that person. Or like, I always want to sit next to this person. Cause I would, the, the sort of, uh, agreement was like, yep, just find your pillow and have a seat. The next time they come in, they'll see a piece, we call this the art gallery. Um, they had a piece, literally a piece of the wall that was theirs and it was theirs for the entire year. So this, A, this made it easier for me because then I didn't have to do a lot of bulletin board changing. <laughs> um, in the beginning of the year, uh, the kids got to choose what they wanted to put up on their wall they bring something from home. Again, this was like a kind of a purpose um, thing. So bring something you want to put up on your wall. Some kids would bring, um, you know, like little bags of sand from their vacation, Red Sox tickets, picture of their mom or, um, you know, picture of their, their dog. But they always knew whatever they wanted to put up on, the wall, on their wall was their choice. And they could always look up to that part of the wall and know that was theirs. So this pattern system, again, while it feels like it's very organizational oriented, um, the implicit message that kind of comes from this, okay. I'm unique, but I'm also part of a community. Here's another thing that you can be thinking about that we all know happens in a classroom is transitioning from home to school. Sometimes it's amazing. Thanks, bye dad, bye mom, see you later. That's it for like the first two weeks. Week three, ah, you're like prying them off <laughs> in the car seat. Ah! So things like having um, uh, clear transitions. So something like a protocol of we're going to do these three things. <laughs> Tell me you're going to be back. Tell me you're going to be by. I had in my classroom a goodbye window where again, after we do our little hugging in the classroom, I'm gonna do a last little wave to you, um, say goodbye. And also it's a way that kids can say goodbye to the classroom at the end of the day. Cause you definitely have kids who are kind of like, I don't wanna leave. And you're like, uh, one of the important messages is that I can express a range of emotions. But for this particular message, I find it really important because often, you know, when we think of those, you know, like sadness or those, you know, I'm gonna put quote unquote negative emotions, uh, uh, anger, right? We think of them as bad. We label them as bad, but it's really important to kind of give 
children a full range of their emotions, right? We are human, right? We feel uh, bad sometimes. We feel angry sometimes. Um, and you are going to have a difficult time transitioning sometimes. And it's important that like that children and families get the message that like that even in the even when you're feeling that way, you are still welcome here. This is still your space. Let's take a look at some other kind of routines. And some of these may be really um, familiar in your classroom. Um, sometimes a question of the day that they can simply answer. And again, you'll see here their patterns that they can either use patterns or their picture. How'd you get to school today? Um, little classroom jobs, again, as um, using images from your classroom are also really powerful. So having things like that in the classroom where kids can answer, and again, they can have um, different answers. It's Interact important. With yeah, mm -hmm. it's important to have like to change up maybe the question of the day um, to like something they have during a week so that they can kind of see like, oh, I walked to school three times and I drove, I came on, on, on button wheels on two times. So there, there's another little um, sort of learning moment that uh, friends can do. And again, also having classroom jobs um, that again, the implicit message is that they have purpose and they have responsibilities in the classroom. Here are some other kind of classroom routines that you might wanna set up. Um, this is something called outside my window. Um, so this is sort of, uh, you, you can do uh, like a weather chart. Somebody's job is to look outside the window and maybe set the weather clock. And again, each kid can do their own or they can do a drawing um, over there on the side there that they can do. Um, later on in the units, you can use it um, to complement the unit. So for example, the first unit is family. And so maybe the outside my window is when you look outside the window, how many strollers do you see? How many uh, siblings do you see outside? Uh, journal writing is another really nice uh, arrival routine. Um, I really encourage that this be very, very free and open for kids. So again, you see their little pattern here so they know where to go get their journals. And, you know, there are a variety of different prompts that you can use for, for folks, for our little friends to use. They can just draw pictures of their weekend news. They can do observations of your class pet. Or again, thinking about your class. You, you don't have to make them these little books. They can actually be this big poster size if you wanted to, if that's a little bit more manageable for, your, um, um, for, for some of uh, your kids. But the idea again is that they can um, do what they would like to do with that. Another arrival routine that, that folks often do is they have kids look at books. And so we're going to talk about this in a little more detail, but it's really important that, you know, our, our instructional materials, our books, um, the things that they're using um, really do reflect them, but also reflect a variety of, of, of uh, families, uh, communities, et cetera. Here are some, and again, and not sort of just relegate them to um, like we always talk about, you know, just having, you know, black authors on Black History Month or, you know, Asian um, authors for Chinese New Year, but that it really is something that they see not just racial and cultural diversity, but diversity in, uh, in terms of socioeconomic um, situations family structures, um, culture, experience, gender, mm -hmm. age, etc. And then also the book should be um, thinking about ways to um, make them accessible and exciting um, and really interactive for kids. So not just books, but characters that they could, because again, that they can act out the stories um, little pieces of uh, cloth or little little characters that they can act out the story as well with illustrations from the story. Um, yeah. And again, so the idea here is that they can express their ideas and their thoughts. And implicitly that they can see their experience and those of others reflected. Uh, any materials that you're sharing should have like a, a window uh, in a mirror. So a mirror in that they're reflecting children's cultural, you know, uh, ways of being, experiences, uh, language, um, and then a, a window in the sense that you're giving them a window into another culture, another language, another way of being. So oh, uh, a, a big part of our curriculum um, 
While it's materials intensive, we really try to emphasize the use of what we call beautiful stuff, recycled materials, so that, that there isn't a lot of out cost um, for classrooms to do. And the other piece too, is that these kinds of materials actually, actually um, promote creativity yeah. and innovation and they, critical thinking. It's kind of like, um, there's this term called cognitive demand. Mm -hmm. And it basically means the amount of thinking that you, you need to do to complete any task, to do anything, right? And the more detailed any material you're using has, right? The more detailed, you know, like a particular action figure or doll, right? If it has a lot of detail into it, there's less cognitive demand because it's giving you a lot of information. It's giving you too much information. When you use like natural materials or beautiful things, right? They, there are things that were already like used and, and you're repurposing them. So you're mm -hmm. thinking about using them in a creative way, which increases cognitive demand. So the more kids can literally manipulate a material, make it their own, think about all the different ways that it can be used um, and be representative. Um, those little brains, those little brain neurons are firing even faster because mm -hmm. they are not given, here's a bridge set, here's a box and some pipe cleaners and some you know, pieces of cardboard. Can you make the Zakem bridge, which is a bridge here in Boston. And so you know, it requires that they look carefully at the bridge they're trying to make. They're trying to make the same sort of structures. They're testing it out. Um, you know, this is essentially what you know, entrepreneurs and people at like Google and Facebook and all those other kinds of places that this is the kind of thinking that we're going to need um, our workforce and our, our, our citizenry to be able to be doing um, in the future and, and now, right? To really be thinking creatively and innovatively. Um, also over here on the left-hand side, I'm always, again, I'm always a big fan about it. You don't have to really go buy all these different things. So um, for example, you can transform whatever you already still have in your classroom. These are, um, they're working on like a forest unit. So rather than necessarily going and buying a bunch of those little uh, animals, which I do love, you can just take pictures and um, tape them onto your blocks um, when they do a study of different um, habitats. We cover um, some of our blocks in white to represent snow. I know that's not something y'all know about, <laughs> but you can cover them in shiny material to make water or blue to make sky and just sort of see how kids can kind of put that together without having, and, you know, and again, obviously you can take off and put on different materials um, that make regular, uh, what's already in your classroom um, more exciting and more innovative. So again, having these kinds of materials that are truly open-ended and that have multiple possibilities really says to kids, you know, that their curiosity and creativity is valued.